Hey, my name is Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is dedicated to the archaeology of North America, in particular the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today I want to revisit one of my oldest videos from back in 2020 uh, about axes in the archaeological record. In that video, I said that um, chipstone artifacts like the Allered Axe or Guilford Axes probably weren't actually used for cutting wood because the nature of chert is such that in when it impacts hard objects, it tends to shatter rather than chop, uh, unless it's been polished. And I had to reevaluate that somewhat uh, when I saw this footage of someone using a replica Guilford axe to chop down a small tree. Now, Guilford axes are common in the Carolina Piedmont region, where there's a lot of soft, spongy tree species like this that can absorb some of that impact shock and not cause the blade to shatter. Now, according to this paper in 2012, a lot of these have been dated to the Middle Archaic period, which makes a certain amount of sense because in that Piedmont region, during the Middle Archaic, the softwood pine forests were starting to expand, and so this would actually be useful in that kind of environment. That said, the Guilford Axe is not an ideal tool for cutting down most tree species in the vast eastern woodlands, and other axe types have a wider range of applicability and more longevity in the archaeological record. So this study was published in 2001 by a graduate student named Lana Crucifix. She experimentally replicated axes, multiple axes, of two types from the archaeological record, then used them to evaluate the differences in effectiveness and maintenance requirements and manufacturing costs. One type was the Witchery 4C copper axe, and the other was the three-quarter grooved stone axe. She picked these two artifact types because they're found in about the same geological region, or geographical region rather, and they co-occur at about the same time period up in, you know, Wisconsin area. It's also noteworthy that both groundstone and copper axes continued to be used well after the Archaic period into the woodland and even into the Mississippian period. And in fact, the, the, groundstone, uh, the groundstone axes continue to be used all the way up until colonization started into the uh, 1600s. She gets into some detail about the methods of manufacture for these copper axes that she's working with, but I've already kind of trod those paths in a few other videos. Um, it's, we talked about it a bit in uh, my interview with David Pompiani, so if you haven't seen that yet, I'll leave a link to that down in the description. Or you can just read the uh, Crucifix master's thesis. It, her manufacturing instructions start on page 119. And the method she actually used was to take nuggets of native float copper from Michigan and put them into a small pit. I think she said it was like 50 centimeters by 30 or something like that, and bury the nuggets in wood coals. And she describes how she would work two pieces at a time in rotations. Quote, I found that the most efficient method for working the nuggets was in pairs, with one axe cooling or being worked, while the second was annealing. The process was naturally divided into work cycles, with a cycle composed of a round of cold hammering until the copper became hard and brittle, usually four to six minutes, annealing, 15 to 20 minutes, and cooling, 10 minutes, for a total work time of approximately 35 minutes. To ensure the axes were fully annealed, I made sure the copper reached a minimum temperature of 500 degrees Celsius and was held at that temperature for at least 15 minutes. Now, during this process, she describes how she used a flat stone anvil and a uh, gabbro hammer stone, gabbro is a kind of um, volcanic rock, for some of these replicas. And then for others, just to speed things up, she used a uh, ball peen hammer. She also used uh, both sand and rock abrasion for the final uh, shaping and polishing, and uh, metal files to be able to compare differences in working times and found that modern files were only about 50% more efficient than sand and rock grinding, on average. These finished pieces were socketed 
into uh, ash handles over two feet long. The other axe type that Crucifix experimentally reproduced was the three-quarter grooved axe. These have a groove that runs around three of the four sides of the axe head, and the other side is ground flat. In the Great Lakes region, these tend to correspond to the Middle Archaic period in age, and they're generally made from cobbles of igneous stone and are pecked and ground into shape. I have not made one before, but I'm told it's a fairly mindless process. The materials are usually gabbro, which, like I said, is a it's like a basalt that cooled slowly instead of quickly. Diabase is also a common alternative. All of these materials are durable enough to withstand impact with plant fibers, but soft enough that uh, you can actually effectively work them. They can be ground and polished. So pecking is the first step of the process, and that's just where you take your your you know, blank and lightly peck at it, which is going to gradually pulverize uh, crystals on the worked surface. And then the preform is ground against another flat-ish stone uh, with a combination of water and sand to shape the edge of the blade. And they can finally be polished against, you know, a piece of leather or much finer silt stones or mud stones. Mm -hmm. Stone is more brittle than annealed copper, so stone axes must necessarily be bigger and wider and more chunky, which means they're going to be heavier also. And their blades have to be sharpened at much wider angles. So uh, I, th I think she mentioned that 55 degrees is about as acute of an angle as you want because they're any more acute than that, and the blades tend to start chipping off. Um, so you're dealing with a much... Uh, more, it looks more like a splitting maul than a uh, cross-cutting axe. But these are actually made for cross-cutting grains. They're, they're not necessarily intended uh, for, for wood splitting. So, Crucifix made two replica three-quarter grooved stone axes, which required a total of 72 work hours to produce both of them. Not each of them, but both of them. And despite this, Crucifix uh, calculated that when you factor in the amount of firewood needed to work the copper and the amount of trial and error required to develop the techniques you need to make the copper tools, um, the copper axe really represents a much higher investment of time and energy. Now, the final experiment was to actually use these axes and do a functional analysis of them. She used two specimens for each each category, and also a secret third category, which were wound up not working at all. And it gets into the technical aspects of how axes are annealed and, and quenched and things like that. So uh, I won't get into all that. But the two that actually worked um, were used to cut a series of four inch thick box elder branches. They, they actually range from like eight to 13 inches in thickness, but they were all mixed up so that that would average out. And her assistants would use these these replica axes in order to cut these uh, these branches in half and timed how long and how many chops it would take to actually get through them. And what they found was that the stone axes actually required a different technique. You kind of have to use the weight of the axe itself to do the chopping. Even so, even you're, you, though you're using the gravity to do most of the work, it was found that you needed to take more breaks. Uh, it, it's kind of more exhausting to use the stone axe than it was the copper axe. However, the copper axe, even though it was able to get through the uh, branches in less time and with fewer chops, it also required more stops in order to uh, resharpen and rework the blade. Once the stone axes were sharpened, they never had to be resharpened for the duration of this entire experiment. The copper axes needed repeated reworking and resharpening and straightening out in some cases in order to make them effective. One of the other aspects that was interesting about this is that with the copper axes, since they are inherently thinner the way that they were made, you can get more of a V-shaped wedge in the uh, in the branches that you're cutting or in the logs or what have you because the celts are or the three-quarter grooved axes are about that wide 
you have to cut a much deeper, rounder, U-shaped wedge notch into the side of the, the thing, which means you're having to remove more wood with the stone axes than you are with the copper axes. So at the end of the experiment, all of the uh, <laughs> chopping assistants uh, reported that yes, the stone axes, they require no maintenance, um, but they're heavier and more cumbersome to use and they're not accustomed to them and using the copper axes, even though they required regular stops to resharpen, uh, were more were preferable to use. It was a more pleasant experience for them to use those than the stone axes. So it was a cool experiment and I think it got to some like cool cool aspects of the pros and cons of these materials. Um, one of the things she talks about is how someone who is accustomed to using a stone axe probably wouldn't have the discomfort with it that these two college students who she was having chop wood for her had. But it also shows that the they're not that different from each other. They're a little bit different from each other in terms of functional efficiency and, and so on, but they're not substantially different from each other in terms of how effective they were at the task of, of cutting through wood. It was only a, a few minutes more using the stone axe, but the upfront time investment and, and labor investment to manufacture the copper axes was substantially higher, which indicated to crucifix that these are kind of go into a class of um, like functional prestige items they are they work they are intended to do work but uh, they are a form of conspicuous consumption uh, and and do represent a bit of a status item um, not a purely ceremonial or or, or status item but they, there's a certain amount of status inherent to it, uh, which I thought was interesting. Now, of course, the three-quarter grooved axe is not the only kind of ground stone axe that we have in the eastern woodlands. They're preceded by a fully grooved axe where the, the groove runs all the way around the circumference of the, uh, the butt of the axe. And those are more associated with the early archaic. And they're succeeded by completely ungrooved Celt style axes, which are designed to socket into a, uh, a like donut hole in a wooden handle, and there's a there's a really great video kind of doing a side by side of a groundstone celt and a steel axe on the Townsend's channel. I'll put a link to that down below also, and those those celts were used as I said all the way up to the the contact period and even even after there's a PhD disc that I've been perusing that is talking about the the Celts persistent use into the 17th century after steel axes have been incorporated into the toolkit as well they're still using and manufacturing uh, stone axes alongside other materials like steel and iron so that's all I've got to talk about uh, for axes on this particular video. I hope that that was interesting and informative for you. And as always, thank you for watching.